gendering democracy. As briefly outlined, democracy remains a contested concept in both political science and philosophy. Feminist theories of democracy encompass a range of approaches that highlight the gendered dimensions of political power within democratic systems. Feminist critics seek to challenge and transform patriarchal structures to promote greater gender equality and inclusivity in democratic processes. Common goals include challenging gender inequalities, promoting women's and LGBTQI rights and participation, and transforming democratic systems to be more inclusive, equitable, and responsive to diverse perspectives and needs. Feminist theories of democracy center around the idea that women's and LGBTQI empowerment is essential for achieving a truly democratic society. They challenge the traditional understanding of democracy by highlighting how intersectional inequalities persist and influence political systems, how they define politics and the political, i.e., practical and normative dimensions. Feminist theories of democracy often seek to go beyond procedural democracy, i.e., focusing solely on formal rules and procedures in decision-making, and aim to modify democracy fundamentally. These approaches challenge and seek to alter existing power structures, norms, and institutions perpetuating inequality and injustice. They envision democracy as a tool for social transformation towards a more just and egalitarian society. While feminist theories of democracy can vary in their specific emphasis and approach, a few central concepts often feature prominently citizenship, participation, and representation. Feminist scholars problematize how gender norms, roles, and expectations shape and constrain political participation, representation, decision-making, and social and political recognition. A feminist intersectional analysis of democracy, therefore, involves studying how gender intersects with other social categories, such as race, ethnicity, class, sexuality, nationality, religion, and disability, to produce specific forms of inequality and discrimination within democratic practices and processes. In what follows, the focus will be on feminist analysis of Western liberal democracy, emphasizing three main categories and their debates within the last century, citizenship, participation, and representation. 1. Citizenship. Feminist theories of citizenship examine gendered dimensions of citizenship and explore the challenges and inequalities within political, social, and legal frameworks. It problematizes traditional understandings of citizenship, often failing to account for gender-based disparities in women's experiences. For centuries, women were denied the right to vote and the same political standing as men. Feminist political thinkers such as Olympe de Gouges and Mary Wollstonecraft challenged women's lack of political autonomy. They assailed the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, adopted in 1789 by the National Constituent Assembly during the French Revolution, for denying women civil and political rights. Women's demands for equal rights were mocked and denounced as dangerous for the nation and society. The backlash against struggles for women's citizenship resulted in de Gouges being convicted of treason and sentenced to execution by guillotine. Olympe de Gouges was punished for demanding equal citizenship for women and enslaved people. 19. It took more than a century to overturn this gendered conception of citizenship, which changed dramatically after suffrage. As voting citizens, women's role in the public sphere was radically modified through their participation in state-making. The right to vote transformed their standing from dependent citizens to autonomous actors by granting them equal participation in statecraft. The legal status and political identity of women as citizens promoted political equality. It also had far-reaching consequences for women's domestic lives and family and community roles. It is important to note here that factors such as race, class, caste, disability, and religion influenced women's citizenship, with working class, black, and indigenous women not having the same effective rights as white bourgeois women. While women today enjoy the same civic and political rights as men in the EU on paper, one must remember that these are relatively recent developments. For instance, Liechtenstein introduced women's suffrage as late as 1984, making it the last European nation to do so. These hard-won rights are again under attack, with women, particularly underprivileged women, being treated as second-class citizens and denied citizenship social, political, and economic benefits. The enduring political underrepresentation of women in Europe makes it imperative to explore strategies that ensure women's full citizenship. This is not just about incorporating women into male spheres of power, rather, this necessitates the disestablishment of the sexual contract. 
a radical transformation that the historical achievement of suffrage could not in itself achieve. Feminist scholars and activists highlight how gender inequalities are embedded within the concept and practices of citizenship. They diagnose how traditional notions of citizenship often exclude or marginalize women and disregard their specific needs, experiences, and rights. One of the cornerstones of liberal democracy is the public sphere, where citizens can contest conditions of inequality and question their exclusion from political arrangements through a practice of societal deliberation. Nancy Fraser offers a theory of citizenship that addresses how social and economic inequalities can undermine democratic participation and the full exercise of citizenship's promised rights, even when formal and legal parity of participation prevail. She challenges traditional conceptions of citizenship by highlighting the importance of social and economic justice in sustaining democratic societies. Fraser's theory centers around the concept of participatory parity, which emphasizes the equal distribution of resources necessary for individuals to participate in society fully. She argues that citizenship should entail formal political rights, legal protections, and the social and economic conditions that enable individuals to exercise those rights effectively. Therefore, participatory parity requires substantive social equality. This does not mean that everyone must have exactly the same income, but it does require the sort of rough equality that is inconsistent with systematically generated relations of dominance and subordination. Fraser, 1990, page 65. Accordingly, achieving participatory parity requires the dimensions of both recognition and redistribution to be considered simultaneously. Social movements and political struggles should aim to challenge and transform structures and systems that perpetuate social and economic inequalities, ultimately ushering in more inclusive and egalitarian citizenship. Overall, Nancy Fraser's theory of citizenship provides a framework for reimagining citizenship beyond formal legal rights and political participation. Normative legitimacy and political efficacy of public opinion are essential to the concept of the public sphere in democratic theory. Fraser proposes Subaltern Counterpublics, 1990, page 67, as an antidote to the exclusionary mechanisms implicit in homogenized public spheres. This encompasses four aspects, one, a focus on inequalities in deliberation, two, a move from Jürgen Habermas's unitary to a more plural conception of the public, the inclusion of self-interest in deliberation when self-interest is constrained by fairness and rights and an overcoming of a sharp distinction between civil society and state, as these spheres are interrelated and both subject to democratic norms. Contemporary democracies are founded on universal principles of justice and human rights, but these do not equally apply to all groups within the territory. The restrictions on political membership or the exclusion of marginalized groups within democratic processes have always been a central issue for feminist theories of democracy. They struggle for more effective and inclusive democratic procedures that safeguard plurality and egalitarian membership. The notion of pluralism is further elaborated by Chantal Mouf in order to challenge the homogeneous and harmonious vision of the political community. Societies are characterized by conflicts and divisions rooted in various social, economic, and cultural factors. According to Mouf, these conflicts cannot be eliminated and so should be recognized and channeled into democratic processes. This implies that citizenship is an ongoing, dynamic process of political engagement rather than a fixed status. Muff emphasizes the importance of political agency and the right to dissent as essential components of democratic citizenship. Central to Muff's theory is the concept of agonistic pluralism, 2000, page 69, which focuses on the necessity of political disagreement and confrontation. Instead of seeking to eliminate or suppress conflicts, democratic societies should create spaces to express and negotiate conflicting interests, values, and ideologies. Muff explains that he relation between social agents becomes more democratic only as far as they accept the particularity and the limitation of their claims, that is, only in so far as they recognize their mutual relation as one from which power is ineradicable, 2000, page 21. Through democratic agonism, which acknowledges and embraces the existence of conflict, citizens can engage in a productive and transformative exchange of ideas and interests. Muff also emphasizes the importance of the political community and collective identities in citizenship. Citizens should be able to identify with and participate in various political and social groups that reflect their values and interests.
These groups can act as arenas for political mobilization, articulation of demands, and formation of shared identities, providing citizens with a sense of belonging and fostering transformative political engagement. Another important contribution to feminist democratic theory is Sayla Ben Habib's concept of democratic iterations. This alludes to the possibility of reappropriation and resignification of citizenship in order to enable the extension of democratic voice. Democratic rule, according to Ben Habib, has been based on various constitutive illusions, such as the homogenization of the people and territorial self sufficiency. We face the challenge of reconfiguring the democratic voice without resorting to these illusions. Democratic Iteration, 2006, page 45, interrogates how universal norms can respond to particular interests while remaining true to a universalist liberal model. Ben Habib, 2004, page 179, conceives of iteration as repetition leading to changes directed towards consensus between different positions within a heterogeneous liberal democratic society, Zafer and Milan, 2014, page 311. Transformations through democratic iterations constitute a space that mediates between institutionalized legal norms and demands for change initiated by civil society actors. Ben Habib's treatment of statelessness, asylum, and immigration attempts to integrate excluded actors into the political sphere to deepen democratization. For her, legal norms evolve into self dash. Reflective norms by transforming the principles informing legal decisions and our understanding of democracy, the criteria for membership in a democratic state, and the rights of minority groups within its territory, Ben Habib, 2011, page 76. Thus, for Ben Habib, democratic iteration transforms not only legal norms but also the identities of civil society actors involved in this process. Emancipatory social movements and civil society actors often pursue such changes and are usually subject to political contestation. Wendy Brown explores the relationship between citizenship and neoliberalism and offers another crucial insight into citizenship. Traditional conceptions of citizenship, historically tied to the nation-state and focused on rights, duties, and participation within a bounded political community, have been transformed under neoliberalism. As a form of governmentality, neoliberalism is not simply a set of economic policies, it is not only about facilitating free trade, maximizing corporate profits, and challenging welfareism is not only or even primarily focused on the economy, it involves extending and disseminating market values to all institutions and social action, even as the market itself remains a distinctive player. 2003, pages 39 to 40. According to Brown, neoliberalism has reconfigured citizenship, turning it into a form of market-oriented consumerism and eroding its democratic and collective dimensions. In neoliberalism, citizenship is no longer primarily defined by political participation and civic engagement but is reduced to a set of consumer choices and market-driven behaviors. Brown aversed that neoliberal citizenship emphasizes the individual's responsibility for their own well-being and success while neglecting the social and collective dimensions of citizenship. Citizens are transformed into calculating creatures whose moral autonomy is measured by their capacity for self-care, the ability to provide for their own needs and service their own ambitions, 2003, page 42. As a result, citizens are encouraged to view themselves primarily as consumers rather than political actors. As entrepreneurial actors in every sphere of life, they prioritize their self-interest over the common good. Consequently, depoliticized citizens are reduced to an unprecedented degree of passivity and political complacency. The neoliberal citizen is calculating rather than rule-abiding. 2003, page 43. Brown's diagnosis challenges the market-oriented and individualistic understanding of citizenship, emphasizing the need to reclaim its democratic and collective dimensions. It invites the development and promulgation of a counter-rationality, a different figuration of human beings, citizenship, economic life, and the political, which is critical both to the long labor of fashioning a more just future and to the immediate task of challenging deadly policies, 2003, page 59. These concepts show that by inserting new actors into the political stage, democratization promises to instigate a dialogue on the meaning of citizenship. It is well accepted that socially vulnerable and marginalized groups cannot have their interests represented in political systems with the same ease as the more privileged actors. 
Democracy and its egalitarian principle that everyone, regardless of their background, social identity, or migratory status, is entitled to shape government rules, represent a central promise for marginalized or excluded groups to claim rights and to influence politics. Although the focus has primarily been on minorities or marginalized groups in Western nation-states or Central European countries in discussions on the enhancement of democratization through the progressive inclusion of excluded groups into democratic decision-making, it is also imperative to consider the challenges of furthering democratization within a post-colonial and a post-Soviet context. Contemporary democratic theories should envisage mechanisms for protecting the rights of excluded and marginalized groups on a transnational level. Here is where the notion of subalternity, one of the central concepts of feminist postcolonial theory, comes into play. Gayatri Spivak explains that when a citizen cannot claim the public sphere, a certain form of subalternity is reproduced. The precarious position of subalterns excludes them from all access to democratic membership and decision-making. Democratic participation is impossible as their claims are not acknowledged like those of more privileged citizens. Social differences such as race, class, ethnicity, gender, and disability, among others, preclude the recognition of democratic voices or reproduce forms of discrimination and exclusion. The concept of subalternity indicates the limits of democracy and citizenship. Formal voting rights without access to the public sphere do not enable subalterns and excluded groups to make their interests count. Spivak argues that democracy is not just about economic empowerment, rather, it entails putting every citizen, even if abstractly, into a position of being able to govern. By activating habits of democracy, Spivak aims to imagine a democracy that does not reproduce the class apartheid of contemporary democracies, 2008, page 21. This imagined or future democracy remains in the motive to come, namely, a process and not an event, safer in Milan, 2014, page 319. The goal is to enable discriminated and subaltern groups to make claims on the state within the formal grammar of rights and citizenship, to activate a democracy from below. While subaltern subjects gain access to democratic structures through a new pedagogy, the transnational elites, in turn, should learn from subaltern groups to question their assumptions, privileges, and imbrication in hegemonic structures. This pedagogy of reciprocal learning between transnational elites and rural subalterns contributes to transnational literacy and planetary ethics in a new age of democracy. Digital spaces have further opened up debates on how virtual publics function as sites for democratic participation and activism. The term digital citizenship was coined to describe this new phenomenon, encompassing digital literacy, equal access to digital technologies, and opportunities for participation and self-expression. These technologies engender rights and rules that govern online behavior. However, they also bring new forms of backlash and discriminatory practices. More recently, scholars have shifted their attention to the emerging threats in the digital sphere to women's participation in politics and public life. Some examples of this are Kate Minet's study of misogyny, Richard Fox and Jennifer Lawless' study of the gender gaps in self-efficacy perceptions when deciding to run for office, Mona Crook and Juliana Sannon's study of violence against female politicians, with a particular focus on digital spaces. Helen Margetts, 2019, page 117, argues that social media misogyny threatens to discourage a whole generation of women and ethnic minorities from public life. Similarly, Kathleen McNutt, while highlighting the opportunities that e-government and digital democracy open up, discusses how these can exacerbate existing structural inequalities for women and members of marginalized groups if these inequalities are not explicitly addressed at the time of system design. Nicola Henry et al. also shed light on how gender power relations and hierarchies operate to shape digital citizenship. Drawing on the intersectional feminist approach, they offer a critique of its promise and practice as well as feminist solutions to overcoming the shortcomings of digital citizenship in its current forms. Among the key issues discussed is the unconscious bias within data and algorithms that sustain stereotypes, perpetuate systems of oppression, and contribute to the unequal distribution of power, resources, and opportunities. Another problem is the gender gap in access and ability to effectively utilize technology. This gap is wider in the global South and among the first-generation immigrant women and women who experience poverty and disenfranchisement in the global North. A further concern is many forms of technology-facilitated abuse against women, girls, and LGBTQI persons that negatively affect their participation in online spaces and their experience with digital citizenship. 
These drawbacks notwithstanding, technology can empower women, broadly defined, and people from historically less privileged backgrounds to exercise their agency and share their experiences in the local context. This was the case with the hashtag MeToo movement, which ultimately created solidarity and difference. Effective democratization is unattainable without substantial participation. 2. Participation Early feminist contributions to democratic political theory focused on dismantling the public-slash-private divide, which essentially excluded women from participation in the public sphere, even as it served as the foundation for male citizens' participation. Feminist scholars also questioned traditional gender roles in the family and community that supported unequal participation in democratic polities. Carol Pateman and Susan Okin, two pioneering feminist thinkers, engaged with classical liberal political theorists such as Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau and challenged their idea of a gender-neutral social contract. As a thought experiment that explained the emergence of modern societies, social contract theory argued that rational actors willingly transfer some of their rights, namely the right to defend themselves, to a central authority, which guarantees the rule of law and peaceful coexistence. They are granted protection of life, liberty, and property from a war of all against all and otherwise inherent to the state of nature. Liberal feminists like Carol Pateman and Susan Okin pointed out that the social contract rests on the divide between public and private, which operates under two sets of laws and assumptions, one based on equality and free agency, and another based on inequality and oppression. They further examine how a male citizen's participation in politics is only possible because of the free time he gains, while women are burdened with care work. In her book, The Sexual Contract, Carol Pateman argues that the sexual division of labor in the household and its hierarchical structure, which places the man as the head of the family, is best understood as a contract prior to the social contract, which is among men who are considered equal and autonomous. This sexual contract, which involves marriage and reproduction, excludes women from political participation. It subordinates them to the will of men, who represent their interests in the public. The world of liberal egalitarian rights guaranteed by a social contract was built, Pateman argues, on a foundation of exploitation, domination, and subordination of women to men, which violates the idea of a contract, a legal instrument that equal parties enter freely. Susan Okin, in her book Justice, Gender, Family, also assails the public-slash-private divide created by liberalism and indicts the family as an inherently oppressive institution that prevents women from participating in the public sphere. For Okin, as for other liberal feminists. 24. The personal is political, such that the family is a site of patriarchal power. This power hierarchy stems from the division of labor between the sexes, which is assumed to be part of the natural order in liberalism, Okin, 1989, page 125. Power hierarchies that emerge in the private sphere of the family translate into and are supported by other structural inequalities that women experience in the public sphere, Okin, 1989, 132, 138, thus affecting the choices women make, the opportunities they pursue, and those in which they can succeed, Okin, 1989, page 147. Dismantling the private-slash-public divide and contesting essentialist gender roles has had wide-ranging implications. Firstly, it raised awareness that men and women are entitled to the same rights and privileges. It further introduced a radical idea that women are capable political subjects adept at making their own choices, determining their interests, acting on them, working outside the domestic sphere, and participating in politics. Moreover, it focused on the role of the state and society in perpetuating but also in eliminating gender disparity. The goal is to mitigate the lack of women's participation and representation in politics by drawing attention to discriminatory social policies and their gendered repercussions. Data gathering exercises, which document the impact of inequality and injustice, play a crucial role in understanding gender relations and have become a standard item in survey research. The newer generation of feminist scholars continues to examine formal and informal modes of women's participation in politics as well as their implications for democratic political theory. For instance, Pamela Paxton argues that if one were to explicitly consider female suffrage as a necessary condition for democracy, then one would find very different country groupings in the famous Huntington's Waves of Democracy, Paxton, 2012, page 48. Furthermore, if women's participation or lack thereof is seriously considered, it reveals that democratic institutions are organized around men's lives and interests. 
Women cannot participate on the same terms as men because of their separate roles, their different bodies, and the assumptions that accompany them are not built into the institutions. Lavendusky, 2019, page 24, women's role is restricted to participation in elections as voters, candidates, and elected representatives. Thus, whether and how women can effectively participate in democracy remains high on the agenda of liberal feminist theorists and practitioners. They continue to generate solutions ranging from political quotas to fighting gender stereotypes to encouraging more women to participate in politics. Studies have also explored women's informal participation in democracies as part of feminist movements and the political implications of these. Iris Marion Young identifies four consequences of applying the Republican civic ideal to the liberative spaces that restrict the participation of marginalized social groups. Firstly, a narrow interpretation of what constitutes a good argument is privileged, favoring dispassionate, neutral forms of argumentation over experiential and narrative-based arguments. Secondly, the defense of unity and common interest in the public sphere perpetuates the interests of those already in power. Thirdly, face-to-face -face debate is prioritized, despite the limitations it poses for marginalized groups. Lastly, the participation structure in deliberation is normative, masking the subjective power dynamics. This results in issues being labeled as out of order or not up for discussion without acknowledging the exercise of power involved. Since the 1980s, scholars have criticized Habermas liberal and consensus-based notion of the public sphere for its androcentric and Eurocentric approach. Feminist theorists, for instance, have highlighted the exclusionary nature of the male public sphere and have called for the recognition of feminist counterpublics. Similarly, Marxist scholars have emphasized the importance of material conditions in producing the public, seeking to emphasize the material realities of proletarian counterpublics. Finally, scholars of the Black Liberation Movement have contributed to this conversation by highlighting how the dominant public sphere has been shaped by racial oppression and exclusion. These critical insights challenge the assumptions underlying Habermas' conception of the public sphere and offer alternative visions of democratic participation and inclusion. Feminist approaches outline how the binary division of labor, roles, spaces, and time profoundly impacts various aspects of life, including democratization processes. Participation in such inegalitarian structures and processes reinforces a gendered, racial, and class-based division of labor. With white men monopolizing the public sphere, women and people of color are relegated to invisible labor resulting in lower participation rates. Feminist scholarship concludes that true democratization cannot be achieved without acknowledging and reflecting on gendered, racialized, and class-divided public and private spaces. In the wake of the so-called cultural turn of the 1970s, feminist theories shifted their emphasis from redistribution to recognition and representation. The former approach centered around material equality and redistribution and claimed that overcoming the gender division of labor and promoting women's participation in the labor market was critical to achieving gender justice and, thus, full political equality. The latter emphasized recognizing sexual differences and deconstructing the categorical opposition between masculine and feminine. This approach emphasizes that to achieve political equality, it is imperative to focus on issues of identity and representation. Nancy Fraser bemoans this shift in feminist democratic thought and claims that the split between redistribution and recognition has seriously weakened feminist struggles to dismantle gender injustice. To overcome the competition between materialist and non-materialist struggles, Fraser, 2007, page 25, proposes a two-dimensional approach to gender justice, theorizing both the gendered character of the political economy and the androcentrism of the cultural order, without reducing either one of them to the other, 2007, page 25. She labels these two dimensions political economic and cultural discursive, with the former corresponding to the focus on redistribution and the latter to the emphasis on recognition. Fraser argues that the dimensions are relatively independent of yet at the same time interacting with each other. According to Fraser, the proposed two-dimensional approach to understanding justice necessitates a corresponding nuanced consideration of gender justice. Such a concept of justice encompasses the traditional concerns of theories of distributive justice, especially poverty, exploitation, inequality, and class differentials, as well as aspects of recognition, especially disrespect, cultural imperialism, and status hierarchy, Fraser, 2007, page 27. 
The current shortcomings of democracies in achieving gender justice are reflected in both dimensions, insofar as the economic structure of society denies women the resources they need to participate fully in social life, it institutionalizes sexist maldistribution. To the extent that women are less than full partners in social and political processes, it institutionalizes sexist misrecognition. In either case, the result is a morally indefensible gender order, Fraser, 2007, page 28. Therefore, what is required is not only the deinstitutionalization of androcentric value, hierarchies, but also the restructuring of the division of labor to eliminate women's double shift, which constitutes a formidable distributive obstacle to their full participation in political life. Any democratic system that aims to be a just system requires participatory parity across all major axes of social differentiation, not only gender, but also race, ethnicity, sexuality, religion, and nationality. Fraser, 2007, page 29. Postcolonial queer feminist scholars supplement this by considering other categories of discrimination that intersect with gender, including but not limited to ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, disability, and or nationality. In addition, more recent contributions also increasingly pay attention to gender inequalities that exceed national boundaries, including questions of participation and representation in intergovernmental and supranational institutions, as well as the transnational public spheres, Fraser, 2006, p. 47f. In contesting misframing, in addition to earlier scholars' emphasis on maldistribution and misrecognition, Fraser, 2006, page 49, describes this newer phase of transnational feminism in reconfiguring gender justice as a three-dimensional problem in which redistribution, recognition, and representation must be integrated in a balanced way. It is worth noting that thus far, we have discussed political participation and its constraints through the liberal and Western feminist lens. Though women are no longer considered a homogenous group, they are still perceived as a group with somewhat shared interests that can be observed, measured, and represented. Postcolonial and intersectional feminists challenge the reified notion of women as a group with shared experiences. They argue that second-wave feminism reflects the interests and aspirations of upper-middle-class white women in the U.S. and cannot represent the experiences of black women, women of color, and women living in the global South. Their understanding of participation, agency, sexual division of labor, oppression, and patriarchy differs from their more privileged counterparts. They further object to the universalization of the Western notion of state and society, calling for more careful attention to local gender and racial power dynamics, not just from the elite's perspective, but also from the oppressed. Against notions of global sisterhood, scholars such as Gayatri Spivak, Chandra Tolpada Mohanty, Lila Abulaghad, Amina Mama, and Kristen Godsey contest imperialist feminist efforts to empower and emancipate their suppressed sisters. They criticize Western-centered, top-down approaches to gender justice and women's human rights promotion. Instead of fostering democratic participation and activating the agency of third-world women, the will to empower discourses feed rescue narratives. This reduces black, migrants, women of color, and women in the global south to mere recipients of solidarity and benevolence instead of a recognition of their agency and voice. The failure to listen to the perspectives of subaltern women reduces them to victim status. It makes them dependent on the efforts of first world agencies, thus perpetuating neocolonial relations. To foster the political participation of traditionally marginalized groups, black, Roma, immigrant, indigenous, and Muslim women, all often excluded from decision-making processes, must be recognized as legitimate political subjects. Elite transnational feminists must unlearn that they are problem solvers and must develop intellectual humility. This would involve listening to solutions generated by subaltern women and opening pathways to facilitate their inclusion in democratic practices. 3. Representation. Like citizenship and political participation, political representation is a core feature of liberal democratic theory. Substantive representation aims to challenge the gender bias inherent in political institutions and bring about substantive gender equality. It is argued that it is not sufficient to have women in political positions, their presence should also lead to meaningful changes in policies, priorities, and decision-making processes that appropriately address women's concerns and interests. 
Karen Seelis, 2008, page 74, explains that the presence of the represented via the representative is a necessary component of representation, but their absence is too. Inclusion and exclusion are inherent aspects of the concept. She distinguishes two approaches for understanding representation, one focusing on the mandate linking the represented and representatives and the other focusing on descriptive representation. While liberal democracies permitted women to be part of the represented much later than men, they ultimately received the right to vote, with representatives now being accountable to them as well. In the second approach, the number of representatives remains skewed towards men, however. Other authors stress the importance of substantive representation, which looks beyond the composition of assemblies and focuses on the extent to which the representatives are acting in the interest of the represented, in a manner responsive to them, Pitkin, 1972, page 209. In this view, women's interests continue to be underrepresented, too. For some scholars, substantive representation is not so much about a representative knowing her constituency's interests, but more about knowing their perspectives. Descriptive representation is viewed as a precondition of substantive representation, not by all authors, yet mere quantitative representation does not suffice to achieve the substantive representation of one's interests. Formal participation, example, as candidates and electorate, is often a prerequisite for descriptive, example, female legislators, and substantive representation, example, through the inclusion of women's issues in the party program. Celis, 2008, page 81. Despite the significant progress of Western democracies in putting women's issues on the agenda, feminist scholars continue to question whether and how democratic institutions are accountable to women and the degree of substantive representation women get on the issues are of particular concern to women, gender pay gap, sexism, childcare, gender-based violence, reproductive rights, and political representation itself, Lavendusky, 2019, page 28. These issues are often not framed in feminist terms, thus making women's experiences invisible, reducing potential gains for women, and creating unanticipated negative consequences. Outlining the link between substantive and descriptive representation, and Phillips argues that having women and other marginalized groups in political assemblies is important. This ensures that diverse voices and perspectives are included in the discussion and demonstrates that women and members of marginalized groups belong in that space. Furthermore, she notes that merely by their presence, women and members from historically underrepresented groups send a message to other legislatures to consider their concerns. For her, democracy then appears as an exciting engagement with a difference, the challenge of the other, the disruption of certainties, the recognition of ambiguities within oneself and one's differences with others, 2006, page 81. If proportional representation of the citizenry is regarded as an essential goal of democratic political systems, then the extent of democracy is constrained insofar as representation continues to favor men to the detriment of women and other genders, minorities, and marginalized groups. Worldwide, women's political representation has historically been and continues to be curbed along multiple lines, including 1. The absence of the active right to vote, excluding them from the represented and from opportunities to gain representation, 2. Descriptive underrepresentation in legislative bodies, 3. Substantive underrepresentation in legislative bodies, as well as 4. The absence of the passive right to vote, excluding them from the representatives and hence their opportunities to represent women, descriptively or substantively. We can look at these two descriptive and substantive representation dimensions from either a quantitative or qualitative perspective or both. From the first perspective, the degree to which a legislative assembly is considered politically representative regarding sex and gender depends on the number of representatives from different genders or the number of legislations that substantively represent women. From the second perspective, representativeness hinges on the qualitative resemblance of representatives and represented, on the descriptive dimension, and the quality of their acts, such as the inclusiveness and scope of women's interests considered in legislation. According to Celis, 2008, page 84, a fully representative system is only given when the ideal type of representation is achieved, which implies, 1, a full and equal formal participation, descriptive representation of men and women reflecting the composition of society as a whole, and substantive representation including representation of women's interests and the gendering of the general interest.
These ideals are distorted by the way in which recruitment and selection processes are organized as well as the elections through which the link between represented and representatives is established. In these areas, both dimensions of gender injustice discussed above, maldistribution and misrecognition, have detrimental consequences for gender equality. An additional, comprehensive overview of the research programs studying the effects of substantive and descriptive representation can be found in Lena Wainerud's work. In recent years, feminist scholars are increasingly paying more attention to the symbolic representation of gender. Building on Pitkin's concept of symbolic representation, Emanuela Lombardo and Petra Meyer explore the role of socially constructed meanings behind the concept of man and woman in politics. They emphasize the importance of understanding the symbolic representation of gender through the discursive construction of women and men as political symbols and finding out how women and men are discursively constructed and how symbols stand for and symbolically represent gender. Page 9. The theory of symbolic representation focuses on the cultural and discursive aspects of representation, exploring how gender norms, stereotypes, and ideologies shape the meanings attached to political symbols, rhetoric, and practices. Feminist theorists argue that gender plays a significant role in shaping these symbolic representations as it influences how women are perceived and treated in politics. For example, associating leadership qualities with traditionally masculine traits like assertiveness or strength may reinforce the notion that women are less suited for leadership positions. Feminist theorists also analyze the role of language in symbolic representation and argue that the language used in political discourse can perpetuate gender inequalities and marginalize women's perspectives. This can be seen in the use of gendered terms or in the trivialization of women's concerns through dismissive or derogatory language. For example, Deviating from the male norm, women in politics are stereotyped in the media as less competent and capable. Feminist theories of symbolic representation highlight the importance of challenging and transforming these gendered representations. They emphasize the need for language and imagery that acknowledges and values women's experiences and perspectives. This includes promoting inclusive language, avoiding stereotypes, and actively challenging and disrupting the dominant gendered narratives. This theory also recognizes the power of counter-symbolism and alternative discourses in challenging gender inequalities. This involves creating new symbols, narratives, and cultural meanings that contest gender norms and redefine women's roles and identities in politics, for example, by creating alternative discourses to foster a more equitable and inclusive political representation for women.